Thank you all for being here. My name is Clarence Spigner. I'm a professor. You wouldn't believe that, would you? Uh, I'm, a <laughs> I'm a professor, and I taught the first Black Lives Matter course here at the university. Uh, we started in 2006, uh, th th 2016. Uh, you would never know that to uh, listen to any of the KUOW or the university press or the alumni magazine. They usually feature folks smiling and grinning and uh, being very happy to be here. Well, that's not so with me. And uh, <laughs> for the next hour or so, you're going to find out why. I'd like to introduce the panel now. And uh, we have Katrina Johnson, and she's the first cousin of Charlene Lyles. Uh, she currently works a nonprofit uh, called R-E-S-T, uh, to help women escape the sex trade. She is a not-this-time activist and a spokesman for her family. She works with and alongside other families that have lost loved ones to police violence, as well as working to reform lethal police force policy and to improve um, uh, police and community relations. Uh, next to her is uh, Jorge Torres. Uh, he is a Seattle activist. Um, and an electrical union member who helped lead a series of Black Lives Matter protests in 2014. Uh, during that time, the police knocked him to the ground while he was using a bullhorn um, at one of the protests. They put him in a hogtie position uh, and they uh, took him to jail. Dash cam video later revealed that the officer was heard to say, if we can get him a pedestrian interference or something along those lines, we can deny them their leader. Um, he's got a megaphone and he appears to be the leader. Another one said, just get the fucking wet back. Now that's what's written here, folks. I would never use such harsh language uh, myself, but um, that's, that's what they said. And uh, I think you, uh, you think you got some money out of it, that too, you know. Thank God for social media. Uh, and then we have Jesse Hagopian um, there. Jesse grew up in Seattle, and he's the father of two boys in the Seattle school public in the, in the Seattle public schools. He teaches ethnic studies Garfield High School, the first ethnic studies program in the school district. Jesse is a member of the Social Equity Ec Educators, uh, serves on the editorial board for of Rethinking Schools, a magazine, and is the co-editor of a new book, Teaching for Black Lives. Jesse serves as director of the Black Education Matters Student Activist Award, uh, a fund he created with the settlement of, um, um, uh, he received from having been wrongly sprayed by the Seattle police. Um, there's a video of that as well. Um, Norm Stamper is uh, with us. Uh, he uh, was a police officer for 34 years, the first 28 being in San Diego, and the last six from 1994 to 2000 as Seattle's police officer. He has a PhD in leadership uh, and human behavior, and he is the author of two books on police reform, Breaking Rank, a top cop's expose of the dark side of American policing, and To Protect and Serve, How to Fix America's Police. And then we have um, Alex Vitale. He is a professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and coordinator of the policing and social justice project there. He has spent at least 25 years writing about policing and consults with police departments and human rights organizations internationally. He's also a frequent essayist whose writings have appeared in the New York Daily News, New York Times, Nation, Gotham Gazette, and the New Inquiry. And he's the author of The End of Policing. So we'll have plenty to say about that. And then we have um, David Correa. 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 Uh, he is an associate professor from the Department of American Studies at the University of New Mexico. He's also the author of Properties of Violence, Law and Land Grant Struggle in Northern New Mexico, and with uh, Tyler Wall, Police, a Field Guide. And then we have Michelle Storms, is a deputy director of the American Civil Liberties Union in Washington State. At the ACLU, Michelle su supervises the policy advocacy group, which focuses on a variety of issues from youth policy to technology to health care access. She also engages in 
police accountability work and helps provide strategic support and direction for the organization. Before coming to the ACLU, Michelle was most recently an assistant dean and executive director of the Gates Public Service Health Program at UW School of Law. And before that, um, she was an attorney uh, at civil legal and organizations such as the uh, Columbia Legal Services and the Northwest Justice Project. Uh, she lives in Seattle and she's raised a son who, is, who attends uh, Seattle Public Schools. So that's our panel. Yes. And uh, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. I'm Katrina Johnson. And I just want to come to you tonight to offer a perspective from the family. Not the one that you hear or see on the news or in the media. For our family, on June 18th, 2017, our family member was gunned down in her home in front of three of her four children when she called the police for help to report a burglary. And that's all we knew. And, and from that day, trying to figure out what's true and what's not has been hard enough within itself because you have to face the police putting out a narrative that dehumanizes and criminalizes your loved one before any investigation even starts. And so it all automatically puts the family on the defense. We are out here trying to grieve and we are not able to do that because we have to fight. We have to fight to, to clear her name. We have to fight because she's not that person that's crazy as the media would have you. She was a mom who loved her kids and who doesn't have issues. I have issues, everybody has issues, but it shouldn't, you should not be condemned to your death because you have issues. There isn't a person out here that doesn't have issues. So then you're, you're trying to go up against a system that is designed to keep people oppressed. And within that, you're trying to seek justice, but there is no justice in that system unless the whole system is dismantled and rebuilt. For my family, we, when I went to the deputy prosecuting attorney's office before the investigation was even complete, they told us that no officer would be charged with my cousin's killing. And I, I'm thinking to myself, how can that be? You don't even have all the evidence. You haven't even gathered everything in. It doesn't matter. It, they have already come to a conclusion because they're investigating themselves. So why would we get any justice out of a system that is investigating itself? And so for us, and for me personally, I realize the only way that I am going to get justice is to fight. And to fight for policy changes, police reform, and so I got behind initiative I-940 for police accountability because without accountability, you have nothing. They will continue to kill our loved ones and blood will continue to be spilled in the streets unless we all get together. Even though it's not happening in your community right now, you are not immune to it coming to your community. It's not a white thing, it's not a black thing, it's, it's everybody, anybody is subject to be killed by the police, whether, whether woman, child, black or white, because they do not have accountability. And until we decide that we want accountability for everybody, whether you be black or brown or white, then there'll be accountability for nobody. And so my thing is we have to go within our communities and begin to educate people and we have to demand change. If, if your law enforcement isn't doing what you need them to do, 
well, I guess you better vote for a better mayor. You have to vote for change. You cannot sit there and be upset and be disenfranchised, but do nothing about it. You have to want change. You have to vote. You have to let your voice be, uh, be heard. Lend your voice to the movement, even though it's not your family member. Because the reality is, if nothing changes, it could be your family member next. And this is not a group that you want to be a member of, because the cost is too high. Now, I know you have plenty of questions, uh, but let's try to hold them to the end. Um, and uh, let's hear from Jose, um, Jorge. Thank you. Uh, I guess I first want to acknowledge that um, my experience, no matter how traumatic or um, belittling or uh, just disempowering it was, it definitely is not in the same type of scenario at all as it is to lose a family member um, and just the, the immeasurable loss around that and an institution that exists without accountability. And I, what I think might be an unabiding anger and rage at that injustice that exists. Um, you know, my experience, I think, might be useful uh, to this panel insofar as it, it points to or, or it shows the, the lengths that um, departments like the Seattle Police Department, but police departments around the country all, all go through to be able to stop dissent and protest and keep things as they are and and how toxic the environment is in those workplaces uh, in police departments. Um, on December 6, 2014, uh, I attended a rally in March that was organized by Women of Color for Systemic Change. Um, they, they organized the demonstration because back to back we had heard that grand juries refused to uh, refused to, to indict uh, the murderers uh, who, who killed Mike Brown and Eric Garner. And across the country, people just were outraged and took to the streets, and in, in Seattle was no different. Um, after the demonstration, there were a number of people who still wanted to voice their frustration and still wanted to march and show the city uh, what it felt like to, to experience this injustice and to see it. Um, and we continued our march throughout the city, uh, throughout downtown. The police kept, kept picking us off one by one throughout the hour that we were marching into the early afternoon, uh, arresting in, in all six people over the course of the march. And I was uh, one of the last ones. Um, as, as it was said earlier, uh, after my arrest, uh, it was found through discovery uh, from uh, my lawyers that the, the one of the officers who had been describing me uh, talked about how they could put certain types of charges against me to be able to justify uh, taking me down and stopping the demonstration. Um, and then also, um, as was heard on the dash cam, which you can, you can find online, it says, uh, the officer said, just get that f***ing uh, wet back. And uh, the, it was with the help of uh, Patricia Sully and the Public Defenders Association um, over the course of months that the, the, the city finally dropped their charges. Um, it was really outrageous. Uh, we, we found the, the report, my arrest report, where the, office, the arresting officer, Burns, uh, describes uh, the the day wholly just unprofessionally uh, a lot of uh, subjectivity a lot of irrelevant information uh, sometimes just fabrications about what happened and what was said um, but he, he uses it all to justify my arrest and to justify the three recommendations of charges uh, which which they, they they gave me which was pedestrian interference reckless endangerment and inciting a riot, uh, 
which the city of Seattle realized that was a little too outlandish and they dropped pretty quickly. Um, but it took a few months for, for it all to finally be, uh, be put away. Um, afterwards, James Bible and the James Bible Law Group uh, approached me. Uh, they've been doing fantastic work over the years and they said that this should not just be let go. I was, I was ready to just accept it as something that just happens um, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, something that's just par for the course, but folks around me really encouraged me to say, take this on, push back against this, put this on record, let it be known, make sure they take notice. Um, and I'm grateful that they did because it's been uh, a really, a really, I think, re-empowering experience to be able to know that, that there are people around me who support this kind of work that we do, uh, who know that we need to be able to hold departments accountable. I think um, one of the things that's really striking to me that we were talking about before the panel was just how willingly and, and ably the, the officers uh, talked uh, on their dash cam, both about me, but also about um, other individuals too. Um, about Native Americans and, ta and saying completely disparaging things about them, about protesters in general. You think about the type of workplace, and think about it, what your workplace would be like if that was just a common occurrence where people just felt like that's just something you can do. Um, it's, it's just completely, it's, it's completely a, a, a horrific, um, especially when you think about the fact that these departments and institutions promote themselves as being there to support the population. It's completely not the case at all. Um, I think that there's a wholesale unaccountability and they know it. They know that they're not accountable and, and it just, the type of environment that it takes to be able to have just flagrant racism, uh, supporting the status quo and propping it up and maintaining it. They're not there to make things better. They're there to keep things as they are. Uh, and I think that creates all sorts of really really just oppressive ideas that, that we all have to face because of it. I think that there's, uh, I think there's a long ways to go for, for demanding real accountability, um, but I'm excited that there's so many people here at this panel tonight because it will take, it will take all of us organizing for the long term, for the long fight, and fighting together. We can win a much better world than we have now. Um, and I'm grateful that this panel is here uh, and that this event is taking place because we can win. Thank you very much, Jose. Um, Jorge, I, I'm sorry. I... <laughs> uh, and now Jesse Hokopian, who has the distinction of having been pepper sprayed by the uh, Seattle Police Department. Well, thank you, Jorge, and, and first I just want to say condolences to the members of um, Charlena Lyles' family here. Um, I know as the one-year anniversary approaches, it just gets harder to deal with the trauma, and um, just know that you have a community here that supports you all, and, and we'll do what we can to lift you up uh, as this um, event gets near. And I think we just need to say it plainly that we have a system of Jim Crow, or we could call it the new Jim Crow policing here in Seattle and around the country, right? Yep. This is a system that's brutalizing black and brown and native people, men and women. And I think that uh, you can tell that from looking at the statistics when you see 412 People have been killed already this year by police, right? Almost a thousand people killed last year alone in the United States by, by police officers. And our society has a tendency to individualize problems that are in fact systemic, right? So whenever I raise these issues, someone comes forward and says, well, not all cops are bad, Jesse, right? That's not the point. That's not the, the question that we're, we're talking about. Of course not every police officer has malice in their heart and wants to uh, slaughter black and brown and native people, right? <laughs> Some of them, I mean, we have uh, people who are uh, realizing the systemic nature of the police and wanting to do something about it. But the problem is 
the system of policing is organized around brutality, right? It's organized around keeping black and brown and native uh, and poor and working class people in line at all costs. And my, my experience with the Seattle Police Department illustrates that. We don't have to philosophize about it. Let's just look step by step at what happened. So I'm on the phone on Martin Luther King Day 2015, standing on the sidewalk uh, at the end of a, a demonstration for Martin Luther King Day, and a police officer assaults me with pepper spray directly in the face and the eyes and the ears. Uh, as I'm on the phone trying to coordinate with my mom a ride to my two-year-old son's birthday party. Okay. Now that assault was bad enough, but if it was just a problem of individual police, then we could handle that and deal with that. The problem was that the Office of Professional Accountability made the bold recommendation of a one-day suspension without pay. What would happen if I had assaulted her? You wouldn't be seeing me right now. I would still be behind bars, right? But for her, accountability in this city means a one-day suspension without pay? Actually, it doesn't. Because the chief of police, Kathleen O'Toole, intervened in my case to make sure that that uh, harsh penalty wasn't carried through. She said that is far too much discipline and erased that from happening. Now, if I hadn't had the incident captured on film, there, there would have been no outcome for me at all. But uh, thankfully, somebody caught it on video. And because of that, we were able to reach a settlement. But let me tell you this. A settlement is not justice. A settlement is not accountability. Mm -hmm. I'm proud to say that I was able to use that settlement, though, to start the Black Education Matters Student Activist Award. And now, every year, I give away $1,000 to deserving youth who are fighting against the school to prison pipeline, against police brutality, and for racial justice in this city. But let me just say, while my case uh, received some attention in this city and, and around the country, too often uh, there's so many cases that don't receive any attention, and it especially happens when we're talking about uh, women who are the victims of police brutality, right? And we need to understand that, and that's why I jumped into organizing and supporting the case of Charlena Lyles and, and fighting for justice. And that's why the night she was killed, I, I went and reached out to the family to meet you all to see what we could do to help. And what the first thing I thought we could do was this. Earlier that year, we'd had an event in the schools called Black Lives Matter at school, and we had gotten 3,000 shirts that said Black Lives Matter, hashtag say her name to the teachers of the Seattle Public Schools. And what we did is in, in two days of Charlena's murder by the police, we were able to get hundreds of teachers to come back to school wearing those shirts in solidarity with Charlena Lyles, which is one of the things I'm most proud of ever having been a part of. Because when you read those despicable, disparaging remarks about her in the newspaper, trying to dehumanize her, trying to say she is outside uh, of our community, that she's not worthy of our love and our respect, right? This changed the narrative. Now they had to talk about her as a mother of kids in the Seattle public schools, and the teachers in Seattle were reaching out and embracing her as part of the community. But too many women don't get recognized for, what, for, for the brutality they experience. And we should remember the names of Jacqueline Slayers, a pregnant mother who was shot to death by Tacoma police officers on January 28th, 2016. We should remember before her the name of Renee Davis, a 23-year-old pregnant mother who was a Native American woman who was five months pregnant and killed by two King County Sheriff's Office on officers in a Muckleshoot Indian Reservation. We should remember the name of Malika Brooks. I just learned about her a couple weeks ago. She's a 33-year-old pregnant woman, and she was driving her 11-year-old kid to school um, in Seattle in a November morning when a police officer stopped her, gave her a ticket, and told her to sign the ticket. Well, she didn't want to sign the ticket because she thought that would be an admission of guilt. 
So the officer deemed her combative like they did to Sandra Bland. And this officer tased her several times, her pregnant body lurching so hard she fell out of the car, right? Um, and I, I just want to recommend to everybody that you read this book, Invisible No More. It's called Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color that traces the history of this police violence from, from slavery through Jim Crow till today uh, against um, black and brown bodies that, that too often go unnoticed. And I just want to end by saying that these experiences show that I wasn't just assaulted by a specific officer. And these women weren't just assaulted by a specific officer. They were assaulted by an, a system of policing that is completely out of control. And we need to, uh, I think, uh, as, Christina, uh, as Katrina said, we need a complete uh, dismantling of this system. And I think an immediate uh, fight that we need to look at is a total disarming of the police department to stop this, this what's really mass murder of communities of color in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Jesse. And uh, now we have someone from the belly of the beast. Uh, <laughs> Norm Stamper. Thank you, I think. I was asked to talk about why we see so much police violence, uh, particularly why white police officers uh, all too often shoot and kill unarmed uh, people of color, young people, poor people, people of color. Uh, and a little bit later, we're going to shift gears, I'm sure, and start talking about what we can do about these things. We must have that conversation. But I couldn't uh, uh, agree more that what we're looking at is a profound systemic challenge uh, in, in reforming police uh, or abolishing police, issues that, that deserve consideration, conversation. But I think there are a, a, a small number of reasons that most of us can agree uh, help to explain why we see so much of this. At the top of my list is that there are too many police officers of all colors, but principally white, who do not place sufficient value on the sanctity of human life. They simply do not. And that they have been taught and told this is the way to be. You see somebody with a knife, you see somebody who may have a gun, you see somebody who you think is a threat to you that will keep you from going home at the end of your shift to your family and your loved ones, then you better take action or you won't be here for that to happen. So we wind up, I think, with a situation in which, number one, too many officers do not place the protection and preservation of human life as their number one priority. Talked to a cop a couple of months ago and he said, Chief, I have a mantra. Every time I hit the streets, I tell myself, nobody dies tonight. Nobody dies tonight. I don't, I'm gonna make it home to my family, but every single person I encounter is gonna survive that encounter. It's a mentality, it's an attitude. It doesn't suggest weakness. On the contrary, it suggests real strength, of, uh, certainly of character. And I did say, and want to repeat, that police officers are doing what they've been taught to do. Here's one problem. We think of teaching or instruction or training as taking place in the academy, and certainly it does. And much improvement is needed there, generally across the board throughout the country. But the most powerful training does not take place in a classroom. It takes place in the front seat of a police car or in the locker room where a senior cop tells a junior cop, this is how we do it in this city. And that gets to the culture, which is a function of the system, a function of the paramilitary bureaucratic structure of American law enforcement which we have to acknowledge comes from a very tainted history. From the very beginning, police in our society have been aligned with tainted ideologies, have been aligned with 
a belief that there are inferior people, that there are criminals, that there are mentally ill people, that there are people who don't look like me or perhaps talk like me or dress like me. And so we wind up with this, this situation in which police officers are viewing the community as the enemy. You don't fight a war without an enemy. You don't fight a war without propaganda. And as we know all too painfully, you don't fight a war without weapons. Uh, weapons of destruction, weapons that, that take lives. There's another issue that must be addressed, and it must be addressed with all the courage and the political will that we muster, and that is we cannot afford scared cops. Frightened cops are impulsive cops. They literally don't see straight. Fear does that to us. It affects our perception, and then it affects our judgment. And so we get an awful lot of horrific situations that are the direct result of unmanaged fear on the part of police officers. Combine that with these other factors and you've got a real problem. A police officer who believes that anybody who happens to be holding a knife is a lethal threat uh, to his or her personal safety. So I think it's vital that we understand that scared cops are dangerous cops. Fear is not a socially acceptable emotion in the cop culture. So there's a lot of compensating going on. There are a lot of police officers talking tougher than they genuinely feel. A lot of police officers using horrific language to talk to their fellow citizens because they're really afraid of their fellow citizens. And they think that by screaming at them, yelling at them, a la Philando uh, Castillo, in, in, in Minnesota, or Laquan McDonald in Chicago, or Walter Scott in North Charleston, South, South Carolina, just screaming at people and eventually using lethal force where no force whatsoever is justified. Two of those that I mentioned in my estimation, my frame of reference, were cold-blooded murders on the part of people that wore the uniform that I used to wear. It's important, I think, that we all understand one fundamental tenet of, of policing as it should be before we get into our, our prescriptions, and that is that the police in America belong to the people, not the other way around. And too many officers convey this attitude in many of their contacts. We're the cops, and you're not. And that attitude, that mentality, is destructive to everyone, including those people who, who wear those uniforms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norm. And now we'll hear from Alex Vitelli, um, the East Coast. Thank you. And I want to say uh, that I'm just thrilled to be here in Seattle and have some, some friends in the audience. This is my first time out here. And uh, super appreciation to the Red May folks who facilitated my uh, being here. So it's very inspiring to hear the fight back, but it's also you know, very moving, the reason that we have to be here. And we should always keep that balance in mind. And when I think about the fight back, and I, and I see the fight back hip, happening here and all across the country, I'm traveling all across the country, and I've been doing this work for, for almost 30 years, and I've seen a lot of cycles of egregious police abuse, community mobilization, some reforms, demobilization, and then more police abuse, and the cycle continues, and we don't always do a very good job of breaking out it. So we've got to ask some tough questions about what do we mean by police reform? Yeah, we want to see police officers held accountable, but what does that mean? What would that really look like? Everyone was so excited when the DA in Baltimore indicted those officers. We're going to get some justice. Did we get any justice? Did any police officers go to jail? Did policing in Baltimore change in any meaningful way? No, it did not. 
No, it did not. In New York, when Amadou Diallo was killed in the vestibule of his building for pulling out his wallet when the cops ran up to him in the middle of the night, massive mobilization huge direct action campaign, shut down police headquarters for weeks. What was the demand? Indict the officers. They were indicted, found not guilty, nothing changed. The movement was demobilized. These weren't real reforms and they're not gonna be possible because they misunderstand the nature of policing. Policing is not the kind of institution that can be fixed by putting a few police officers on trial. First of all, the system is designed not to hold them accountable. The legal systems are created to allow exactly these behaviors. And in the very rare occasion when an officer is caught acting in such an egregious fashion that they are the exception, they become the exception that proves the rule in the sense that the whole institution jettisons them and says, well, that has nothing to do with what we do, and therefore it's no real reflection on us, and therefore there's nothing really that we have to change except to get rid of that one officer. What about the nature of policing itself? Don't can't we just fix policing with some community policing, some de-escalation training, put some body cameras on, have some implicit bias training? That's my favorite. Implicit bias training. This is the idea that people have these unconscious biases that we can measure through, so, uh, through uh, laboratory psychological testing and we put people in front of monitors with little buttons and we get these little micro millisecond differences and that if we could just train officers to be aware of their unconscious, unintentional bias, that this would help end the killing of unarmed black people. But of course, as Jorge pointed out, we don't have a problem of implicit bias. We have a problem of flagrant racism. <laughs> now, this is not so, so that when we look for racism in American policing, we sure find it. When we see the emails, when we get access to the chat rooms, right, when we find the white supremacist tattoos underneath the uniforms, that stuff is all out there and there's nothing implicit about it. But this does not mean that all police officers have to be thought of as racist individuals, because that's just clearly not true. I've spent a career working with police officers, and it's just not true. And, and in a place like New York, a majority of police officers are non-white. In Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, in Detroit, in Philadelphia. But no one's holding up those police departments as models of perfect policing with no problems of racialized policing because it's not about just the bias of an individual police officer. It's about the fundamental mission that we've given the police. Implicit bias is the perfect liberal solution to the problems of policing because it allows politicians to say they're doing something about the race problem in a way that no one is responsible for. It was all a big misunderstanding. I know you didn't mean it. It was an accident. And we're just, could you please not kill any more black people and we'll all be much happier. Thank you very much. Now the problems of racism are about the mission we've given police. A totally professional, unbiased, community-driven, low-level drug arrest is still going to ruin someone's life for no damn good reason. We've had a war on drugs for 40 years. Drugs are cheaper, easier to get, and of more, greater potency than they've ever been. The war on drugs has never had anything to do with public health or public safety. It's about a cynical, toxic politics of race the mobilization of white fear and resentment through the lens of a moralistic crusade around drugs that just drives overdoses, 
death, mass criminalization. So if we want to do something about the problems of policing, we need to quit tinkering with technocratic fixes like body cameras, and we need to ask why we've turned every problem in our communities over to the police to solve, or perhaps more importantly, why we've allowed our elected officials to frame every problem in our communities as a problem that can only be solved by policing. That's the real issue. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, our next speaker, um, he's a professor as well, but he has something in common with Jesse and Jorge. He's had some direct one-on-one -on -one encounters with cops, and uh, perhaps uh, David will tell us about that. Or not, I mean, I think everyone probably, half the people on this panel have been, maybe except for Norm, thrown down on the ground by a cop. <laughs> so I've had that happen to me, but anyways. First of all, I want to just thank uh, the folks, the Red May organizers, um, for bringing us together with this panel. And I want to um, offer my condolences to the family of Charlena Lyles. Um, I got involved directly, not just as a professor or a writer about this, but as an activist in Albuquerque in 2004, when just months before Ferguson police killed James, uh, killed uh, Mike Brown. Albuquerque Police Killed James Boyd. And, and the book that I just recently co-wrote with Tyler Wall, Police, A Field Guide, you know, I made, made certain that we released it on the fourth anniversary of James Boyd's murder. And, and I was involved as an activist, but I was also trying to focus specifically on the fear I had in the wake of the murder of James Boyd by Albuquerque Police, that the forces of police reform we're, go we're going to form in Albuquerque and uh, really eradicate a, a growing movement in Albuquerque that was confronting police directly. And, and so I was writing articles in the local press and I was trying to remind people, you know, between 1987 and 1997, Albuquerque police killed more people per capita than any department in the United States. And then the outrage produced all these reform measures like an absolutely brand new police oversight commission that was unlike any other in the United States. Um, they raised training and hiring standards, and then the police pr uh, promptly killed 23 people in the next three years. So increased the amount of people that they were killing. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, and, I, and so I was writing and I was talking facts. I was saying, you know, look, in, in, in 2014, the Albuquerque Police Department committed 21% of all homicides in the city of Albuquerque. Um, and, I, and I pointed out that, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't matter, all of these reform measures uh, that we were enacting didn't make a difference. As Alex was saying, we've had generations of efforts to reform police. Um, and, and, and then I started to think, what, what, what is it exactly that makes police reform so compelling as an option when all empirical evidence demonstrates that it doesn't actually transform police. And so I started to pay attention to the rhetoric, the, the way that police talk, and the way that we, including activists uh, or professors, talk about police. Um, and I realized a couple things, and I think these are important, and it's what my book, Police, A Field Guide, tries to get at. Um, and there's three things that I want to mention in the time I have. One is that we are offered no alternative to police. Every single person in this room has probably been at a point in your life when you've been in trouble, when you've feared for your life or your safety or your loved one's safety, and who do you have to turn for help? What institution, uh, institutions do we have in our communities that are alternatives to police? We don't have, most of the time we don't have those institutions. Secondly, we're raised, I mean, listen, officer friendly is not just a joke, right? That's an actual program the Chicago Police Department created to put, to, I mean, probably half the people in this room were read to in school by cops, right? Or you went to coffee with a cop, or you were at the state fair and a cop gave your kids stickers, right? Um, we dare is another example. Um, police are, 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 we're told as a, from a very young age that police are the thin blue line. And this is a real, this is a metaphor that police themselves really hold dear to, right? And it's an important one. What is the thin blue line, right? It is police. And it is a line between civilization and savagery. And, and, and it is police that literally is this line. It is a metaphor, but for police it's not a metaphor. And it's thin. It is a thin line 
right? Police are always under attack. They're always confronting threats. Everything is an emergency. This is how police tell their story to your children. But you know what, the most important thing, and this is the third one I'm going to talk about, is that we have no language to talk about police that isn't given to us by police. Police don't just patrol our streets, they patrol the language we have to talk about cops. Every single one of us in here has a cop in our head, right, that, that we have to fight against that wants to see every person as a possible threat, that wants to conceive of every possible circumstance as, a, as an emergency, right? And, and it, so it's a language that, that law endorses and that explains situations that we've talked about on this panel. Why don't that cop, why doesn't that cop get arrested? Why don't they get fired from the force? Um, because that cop is the only cop capable of, uh, of identifying who's a threat, what's a threat, what is an emergency. They have the discretion to make all of those decisions. It doesn't matter if you have a weapon. If the cop thinks you have a weapon, that's the lawful decision by the cop. So wh what do we do then? Because if we, if we are using a language that cops give us to talk about alternatives to cops, the road leads us to more cops. It's not an accident that every police reform process in every city I've ever looked at results in more cops. More cops, more weapons, more equipment, more cops. Why is that? Because we don't have that language. And so we need to start our own language. And, and so the book attempts to pull back the curtain and explain to you what does discretion really mean? How, how, um, what, what is, uh, what is a uh, uh, body cavity search if not state rape, yeah. right? What, is, um, what, what do cops think me justified means? What does unarmed mean when a cop says it, right? And, and how might we actually redefine these, these words and these concepts in a way that gives us collectively a language to talk about real alternatives to policing that have nothing to do about police reform? Because police reform is not about cops. Police reform is about you, right? Police reform is an effort to restore legitimacy in police in times of crisis, and you are the problem because you don't trust the cops. It's your lack of faith in police that constitutes the crisis for police, and police reform is the solution to your lack of faith in police. So when we talk about police reform, we're talking in a language that serves the interest of the institution that guarantees the inequality and racism we've been talking about today on this panel. That's what police reform is about. Thank you, David. And uh, now, um, Michelle, ACLU. Thank you. Um, and I'm really humbled to be here on this panel where there is so much experience and so much knowledge and also want to acknowledge um, the Charlene Lyles family and actually all those who have been impacted by police violence. What I thought I would do with my time is talk a little bit about some of the things that we keep seeing as uh, the problems that arise behind the police violence that takes place. Um, touch on a few of the statistics in Washington State and what some of the efforts have been to make change around how policing is happening here. Um, and then mention a little bit about oversight if I don't run out, if I don't get like that 30 second sign up uh, by the time I get there. So there, there are three big things that just keep showing up every time we look at these incidences where um, there's been excessive use of force and lethal force. So it's racially biased policing, right? It is often a crisis intervention failure, either because there was a lack of sufficient training or the training didn't do the job, right? Particularly where there are issues of mental health and disability with the person who was, who was uh, killed. And um, then of course, just excessive use of force. So these things keep showing up together in combination um, where, we, where we see um, a lethality at the hands of police. So in Seattle, as many of you probably know, there was back in, I guess, about 2011, so many incidences, one after another, um, really kind of culminated with the, uh, the, uh, the police shooting of uh, John T. Williams, the native carver, hard of hearing. He was asked to uh, 
put down his carving knife. He didn't do it. He was shot and killed. And so many of these things happened in rapid succession that uh, several civil rights organizations and community organizations, along with the ACLU, uh, put together a letter to the Department of Justice to have them come out and investigate the Seattle P Police Department. And that was at a time when the Department of Justice was kind of a resource for that, right? Because that's not the case now, right? They're very clear right now that they are not about uh, uh, intervening in police's lawful right to do what they do. So um, they came in, the uh, Seattle police were under a monitor uh, and a court process for uh, several years, which actually just in, I guess, about October of 2017 was reduced to compliance monitoring, so um, less attention to uh, what they're doing, but in sort of a maintenance phase. Like, so basically the decision, the, the finding was they have, they're substantially in compliance with all the things we want them to do. And in fact, there were changes that had happened with Seattle police. Um, there was a finding by the monitor that there's a reduction in use of force because the Department of Justice was clear there is excessive use of force with Seattle Police, but they found a reduction. They put a lot of things in place, and so I guess about April of 2017, the monitor said we're making a lot of progress, and at no expense to police. There's no harm that's happening in the community, but then as you all know, in June of 2017 is when the police shot and killed Charlena Lyles, and it was such a, um, a painful moment, right, because we see that notwithstanding all the things that have happened, this could still happen. A woman could call the police for help and in the presence of her children be shot and killed. And so this is where we know that, you know, as, as they've talked about, uh, police reform isn't so simple as changing a few rules, right? Um, so, Clearly, there is a need for massive culture change in policing, and it's been spoken to a little bit here so far, because uh, police, like all of us, are subject to structure, structural racism, right? That is absolutely present, um, and it's not something that changes overnight. When we look at uh, Flando Castile, which has, who, ha who was also mentioned earlier today, you know, he'd been pulled over um, uh, 31 times and hit with 63 traffic charges before that fatal encounter, and he actually had zero other criminal record apart from the traffic charges that happened because he was pulled over all, all the time, right? So it was a classic case of driving while black. It was nothing but that, right? And that ended up in the end of his life, and those police officers were not held accountable. And that's not unusual because the statistics in the record are pretty clear that um, uh, black, and brown, uh, black and brown people are disproportionately pulled over, and some of that is is implicit bias, and a lot of that is explicit bias, right? So here in Washington State, I just want to tell you a little bit about where we have gone with the numbers, right? So in 2015, there were 16 fatal police shootings. In 2016, so that was 2015. In 2016, there were 26 in Washington State, and then in 2017, 38. So that is a highly problematic rise, and so we're looking at this culture uh, where there's racially biased policing, we're looking at a culture of violence, uh, the militarization of policing, these things are on the rise. These fatalities represent the lives of someone, of people who were loved, right? They were loved by their families, they loved other people. It is just an absolute loss of humanity. Um, that's deeply painful. So one of the things that happened with regard to this move toward accountability and training is, and Katrina already referenced this, right? So many family members who have been impacted by police violence and community members came together and wrote Initiative 940, and that was a community-led effort to try to put some changes in place in Washington State. And the ACLU was proud to support and join that. And the legislature has passed it, um, but it's really only kind of a beginning step. But what I want to tell you is, the thing about Washington State was in our law, a police officer couldn't be held accountable unless there was a finding of malice. And that's really hard to do, because basically you got to have somebody say, 
I'm going to kill somebody right now and then do it, right? Because apart from that, you're really not going to show that. Um, and so one of the key things that 940 did was take that language out of our law and change the standard so it's an objective, good faith standard that a reasonable officer in that situation would feel that there was a need for that level of force. It also um, put in place independent investigation, which is extremely uh, critical and increase the training. But that is, as I'm sure you've gathered from hearing all, from all these folks, really a beginning place, but it's an important place and that was the community that made that happen. So um, I will say that the legislature passed it. There is some litigation going on right now related to whether um, it's going to stand. You'll have to stay tuned for that. I'm not gonna go into all the legalities of it. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, it will, be upheld. If not, it'll be on the ballot and you'll hear about that because we're gonna need you to vote um, to, to lift that up. I think the last thing I wanna say just very quickly is that um, another thing that has happened and certainly we're that we have here in Seattle and King County is community oversight bodies. And so that's also a good start. It's not all of what we need it to be uh, just yet, probably in terms of how much power those bodies have. But in Seattle, uh, basically out of that uh, DOJ process, we got this uh, Seattle Community Police Commission. And in King County, there's the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. And those are professionally staffed entities that have community members who come together to play a role in oversight. And then because of the, um, uh, out of their work, we now have an addition, an office of, um, I don't know why I can't get this out of my mouth, the, a new office of the Inspector General. So there's a lot of those bodies in place um, to help with accountability, and we'll talk more about that because I'm sure there's plenty to, to question about how to make that really actually show up in an effective way uh, for people. Um, I was going to actually comment because I'd heard about the officer who, who says no one dies today, and I think that issue of sanctity of life, which arose out of uh, President Obama's commission, is really a big piece of the key. Right now, we don't have that, right? We don't have that idea from all police officers that no one should die today, and that life is sacred and needs to be upheld, and that's the place that we have to get to. So I'll stop there, and then we have lots to talk about. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, I would be remiss in my duties if I went on with my questions to you. So I'm just going to pose some uh, open-ended questions, um, and we'll deal with my questions later. Uh, I want to really open it up to you to um, uh, ask our panel uh, questions. Uh, then we'll have a break, and then we'll, we'll come back for some of these uh, more open-ended questions. Uh, but let me share the questions with you now. Um, some of these questions have already been dealt with. Yeah, I'm sorry you panelists can't see them, but, uh, you know, maybe our audience will just hit you with it. Hmm? As Amy Hagopian, uh, you know, telling me what to do, as always. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good I follow your advice. Um, this, uh, uh, what is... What is the workplace culture that accounts for the high number of police shootings? And um, here we have a picture here of John T. Williams, who uh, in 2010, uh, if the term murder applies, uh, it certainly happened to him. Anyone who sees that videotape of him just walking with his uh, carving knife, crossing the street, um, the officer gets out of his car, comes, I ask him, drop the knife, and I think, what, maybe two or three seconds later, sh gunshots ring out? And I don't know, this cop might still be around. He might not be on, uh, he's certainly not on um, um, Seattle PD, but um, you know, like priests who abuse children, uh, it's probably someplace else doing the same thing. So that's a question that I hope we can get, some, get into some detail later on and get the response from our panelists. Another question is, um, how can we hold police agencies more accountable? Uh, again, uh, I certainly I read Norm's book and he's got some stuff in there. Um, but some of the questions that our other panelists have uh, mentioned, uh, they're probably a bit more cynical about it, uh, and rightfully so. They've been studying it as well. So hopefully we can have some discussions about that, just how do we hold uh, police officers accountable. 
Another question is, yeah, why is it that the truth doesn't come out until um, the videos are made public? Yeah, this is a scene, you can hardly see it, but this is the La Laquan McDonald killing. And um, it was only through a Freedom of Information Act that a journalist decided to go chase after uh, this, um, this tape that uh, the police had. And um, that's the only reason that came out. And um, the guy shot Laquan uh, 16 times. And uh, a question that's been raised here as well. Uh, why is it that mental illness is such a factor in police violence? Um, how could that be dealt with better? And of course, it doesn't take a genius to realize that why do you send somebody out with a gun to deal with someone who has a mental illness? The cops don't know how to deal with mental illness, okay? But they've got guns, so. Also, uh, this has been brought up as well by our panelists, uh, the war on drugs. You know, Nixon started that uh, back, in the eight, back in the 70s, and uh, it's still with us. And Michelle Alexander has dealt with that in her um, book, The New Jim Crow, and that's been mentioned up here as well. So this whole business of the war on drugs, and that is why we're killing people, and the militarization of the police, as I'm sure all of our panelists uh, know about, and we see, because we've got campus cops walking around with guns. Why do they need guns on a college campus? I don't know, except to harass uh, black males, because on every college campus where we've had guns, um, black males have usually been the ones who um, get accosted by the cops. And here's one that I know Jesse's going to deal with. Um, so what about the school to prison pipeline? And uh, you know, as I said, we all know about the number of um, uh, kids who get expelled uh, for whatever reason, when black kids are acting out the way white kids do, the way Asian kids do, the way Native American kid do, kids do, but the kids of color are the ones who get uh, labeled. And uh, it starts. And then this other question, why are people of color disproportionately victims of police violence? And again, um, maybe this goes back to the slave patrols. I don't know, but, uh, well, I do know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we, this is a question hopefully we can uh, talk about. And then this one, why has Seattle, the little bubble of progressive liberal politics, been particularly hard hit by police violence? I want you to know that it was Amy who wrote this question, OK? It wasn't me. Uh, I agree with the question, but. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but I came up with the picture, yeah. It's uh, those sisters who, uh, who, who uh, confronted Bernie Sanders. And what did the liberals do? They got all upset. Oh my God, why, well, you know, this is Seattle, you can't do that. And uh, thank God for the sisters who, uh, and they're the ones who've been leading the charge, interestingly enough, uh, to really call Seattle out. And so hopefully we can have some discussions about that. But now, uh, questions from the audience, and uh, I, yeah, these folks are ready to go. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Hi. In New York City, there's a... ...an elected civilian review board. ...and they're also calling for... A Uh, so I am I'm obviously uh, uh, quite aware with that uh, that campaign and then they've they've got a, a presence in New York City and on the one hand it uh, lays bare just how inadequate the many levels of police accountability we already have are. We have a Civilian Complaint Review Board. We have an Office of Inspector General. We have an Anti-Corruption Commission. We have an Internal Affairs Division. They don't work. Unfortunately, it is my view that this will not be effective either. There's very little evidence to support these kinds of initiatives. But more importantly, is this the right way to expend our political capital? Wouldn't it be better to use our political capital to 
reduce the scope and power of policing by ending the war on drugs, by ending broken windows policing, by getting police out of our schools, by creating mental health infrastructure so that we don't get the police when we call for help. These are the real progressive reforms that actually build up communities, build up individuals, and reduce our need for policing because I think policing is largely impervious to the kinds of change that, changes that we want. Can I also just make a comment on this too? I just want to also point out, um, I, when, when I talk about, when we talk about reform, we should, uh, there's a scholar, uh, Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and she uses a phrase, uh, non-reformist reforms or reformist reforms. And, and some other scholars have taken this up. Maryam uh, Kaba is one of them, and, and she, sa she uh, exhorts us to support the reforms that actually reduce the scope and, and scale of police and oppose the ones that actually that, that don't do that. So, so when we talk about oversight or lapel cameras or, some, or something, when, when those are proposals, just let's just remember that all the, so then maybe the cop who killed Charlena Lyles loses their job, but she's not with us anymore, and, and that, that won't bring her back. And that lapel camera that the cops might have to wear that they didn't used to wear will just witness the police killing, and, so, and, and, uh, and won't do anything to, to confront the problem before it happens, right? And remember, the lapel camera and police oversight uh, contribute to this, they, they come out of a logic that tells us that police, there might be some problem to police, but they're perfectible. They're always perfectible. Police are always on this path to perfection, and we just have to help them along that path. And if something happens, well, it's just a few, ba few ba bad apples, maybe that lapel camera will train them how to do it better, right? Because they're on their way to the perfection. Um, but what we actually get in practice is just more information about what happened rather than how to stop it. Uh, Steve Lee. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Lee. I'm with the International Socialist Organization. And first of all, I want to say thank you so much to the panel. It was a fantastic uh, presentation by everybody. Um, I, I just want to follow up a little more on what people were saying about um, Getting rid of the, the whole, uh, getting rid of the system, and I think if we go back and look as Clarence pointed out, uh, policing came from the slave patrols in the South, and it came in the North to suppress workers when they were organizing. And it seems like that is a fundamental system. So that led the Black Panther Party to believe that the police were an occupation army in the Black community, and I would contend that they were right about that and that the police are actually an occupation army in every community, especially the black community. Um, so that we need to, we need to uh, n I, and I agree that we don't need the reforms that help the police or make people more amenable to police, but we need the reforms that weaken them. Just well, let me throw out a couple more and see what the panelists think. Whenever there's a lawsuit and the city is fined for police brutality, that money should come directly out of the police budget, not out of the city budget. Um, Jesse's, Jesse's idea of, of disarming the police, I think, is a great idea. Um, um, and, and firing the police on the first instance of, of brutality or racism. So those are just a few ideas that would help weaken, weaken the hold of the police on society. Sure. Thank you for all the work you're doing. I want to expand this a bit, and if it doesn't take us in an interesting direction, that's fine. But um, America, black and white, fought for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And at the end of the war, when we won, we got protection of property. That is the essential goal of American government, is to protect property. It isn't to protect lives. And we, it seems to me that until we see that difference as a profoundly human question about who we are, we're not going to get anywhere. But please keep trying. Don't get me wrong. Uh, 
Hi, I'm uh, Stephen Bisruchka, and I would like to ask the panel a question to consider a more upstream cause for police brutality. I think the situation with police brutality in this country is worse than the other rich countries. We also have the biggest gap between the rich and the poor, and there's displaced aggression by police officers. They're mostly not PhDs out on the beat. Uh, they're relatively low status people in society, and given the choice, they want to put other people below them down. No, you know, we have, th out of the three richest people in this, co in this country, two are, live a stone's throw from here. And if they were at an MLK march, nobody would come up and pepper spray them. So I want the panel to consider if our huge inequality is, in fact, the upstream source of the police brutality. I'll just say a quick word on that. I definitely think that uh, the police force in this nation has always been about policing inequality. You, today we have five people on the planet that have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people, right? Five people have as much as half the planet. You don't, that doesn't just happen magically. How do you end up with that sort of unequal distribution of resources? You have to police that. You have to have a way to maintain that inequality. Otherwise, it doesn't just happen naturally, right? And, I, and that just gets me to the last point I, I want to make, that I think there's a political aspect to policing. I think that the war on drug, the disastrous war on drugs that's really a war on black and brown communities was a reaction to the civil rights movement. Right? So, in fact, when people got together and tried to organize to bring down the structures of Jim Crow segregation, and that movement expanded into the North, into the black power struggle, to actually look at the fundamental inequalities in this country, that was a threat to the United States government. And you don't have to take it from me. You can read the COINTELPRO documents that my students read today in class, right, that were uh, Re released, and you can see that COINTELPRO uh, names Martin Luther King as one of the greatest threats to America, um, the Black Panther Party, and anyone else who was trying to, to combat this inequality. And so how, what do you do after the civil rights movement no longer, you, you can't say the N-word openly, right? You have, to, you have to hide racism. It's no longer respectable uh, publicly. What do you do? Well, instead of having a war on black people, you have a war on drugs. But in, but in reality, it's the same thing, right? And so that, that I think, uh, is something that we have to keep in mind when, when we talk about what the solutions are going to be. Just, okay, Norm, you have something to say about it? Okay. Uh, many people from this community have heard me rail about the war on drugs for a long time. And I think it is vital that we understand the, the historical foundation of that war. And Jesse nailed it when he said that it was, in fact, a calculated effort on the part of our government uh, to assault uh, young people, poor people, and people of color. Richard Nixon went into the Oval Office and spoke to Bob Haldeman and to uh, uh, John Ehrlichman, his two top aides. This is, has been recorded. You can research it. Just YouTube it. You'll find it. And he said, look, we're in no way guaranteed re-election. We have a very unpopular war in Southeast Asia. Uh, there's a lot of unrest on campus, and the Negro is rioting in our cities. Our, many of our cities are on fire. So we need, we need a catalyst to focus the attention of the American people on a, a remedy for the problems of, of law and order. And he, in fact, said, I've been given this a lot of thought. Nobody likes drugs. Well, he was myopic there, but nobody likes drugs. Everybody can get behind this war. The Negro, the hippie will always fight us, but we can overcome that resistance, his language. We can overcome that resistance by waging a war on drugs, which of course was a war on his own people, disproportionately young, poor, and of color. And it is done, as everyone up here has testified to, it is done huge damage, and it must end. We must end the drug war, replace prohibition, a bankrupt, corrupt, organizing principle of the US drug war 
replace it with a regulatory system, put the entire drug issue in the public health arena, deal with people who are addicted to drugs uh, as a medical challenge, which of course is exactly what it is. So I said I wouldn't get into that, but I think it's, it's really important to understand just how significant this war has been. You, you don't wage war, once again, without an enemy. And Nixon uh, essentially said to America's police officers, you're the foot soldiers in this war. And we'll throw at you military equipment, we'll throw at you military weapons and vehicles and the like. And of course, that's just accelerated, as Alex has pointed out, over the many, many years since in June of, of 1971, he declared that war. Okay, listen, we, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, we would like to take a break at about 8 o'clock. So um, uh, we have plenty of time uh, afterwards. Uh, everybody's going to get their questions in, but um, when we take our break, we have some books in the hallway out there that some of you might want to purchase uh, to follow up with what you've heard here. So um, we have time for about one more question, and then we'll take our break, and then we'll be back. Let's take about 10 minutes break and be back. Um, thank you all for being here and sharing your truth and everyone here for honoring the life of Charlena Lyles uh, with this conversation. Um, and just to speak to that comment about property too, like property at the time was defined, like black people were also considered property then. So I think that's like super important to like understand in the context if you're making that argument, um, just to speak to that briefly. But also um, just thinking about like the militarization of police and um, you know, you could argue that the police were militarized with like the foundation of this country with like the Native American genocide. And then that's just been like a continuation of that, that we see, you know, for instance, like in Palestine with, um, you know, the U.S. spending $8, billion, $8 million a day um, to Israel to fund the Palestinian genocide and, um, you know, the Israeli army doing trainings of the police here in the U.S. So it's like, how, how do we broaden the, this conversation to talk about like a global militarization as well as like Native American erasure while still centering like anti-blackness? Um, yeah, that's it. I mean, let me just say one quick word and I'd love to hear what other people think. But to me, I was deeply inspired when I saw the protests in Ferguson after the non-indictment of Darren Wilson for killing Michael Brown. Uh, and they were facing tear gas from the police, right? And as they, they marched and, and um, protested against police murder there, um, Palestinians started tweeting at the marchers in Ferguson saying, we've had that same tear gas used against us. It's made by an Israeli company, and here's the best way to deal with the, the tear gas, right? Giving them um, ideas for how to resist the police in the streets. And I think that moment crystallized the global nature of the problem that we're up against. Um, the world's most powerful governments using their resources to repress people destroy life rather than um, to meet human need. And then the global um, people fighting back and uh, using whatever resources we have to, to um, bring solidarity across borders um, against that kind of repression. Uh, first, I, I thought you were... Uh, first, I, I thought you were going to ask some, uh, say something about your T-shirt, so I'll take the opportunity to just, just mention that, uh, you know, Another area of reform that we need to resist is prison and jail reform. And what we see all across the country are efforts to build new jails under the pretext that they'll be more therapeutic, that they will reduce the level of violence in the jail, that they will have diversion programs attached to them. But these are not real reforms. These are reforms that reinforce a logic of carceral control, of punitiveness, of helping people through threatening them. 
And that's exactly the situation here with the desire by officials, county officials, to build a new youth jail that, again, reinforces this logic. And it's this logic that's at the root of a lot of our problems. This idea that the way we deal with problems is by threatening, controlling, and punishing people. That's, you know, our criminal justice system has become a giant revenge factory. And we can see this connected to international affairs through a kind of ideology of neoconservatism. In foreign affairs, it's about you know, adventurous wars and showing everybody who's boss by invading them, threatening them, et cetera. And at home, we see it through mass occupation of communities, broken windows, policing, et cetera. Um, so, and I just wanted to, well, I'll just say one thing about, we hear a lot about policing growing out of slave patrols. Occasionally we hear about labor control, but the other primary driver of the origins of policing is colonialism. The London Metropolitan Police were created by Sir Robert Peel, whose prior job that no one in normal academic circles talks about, his prior job was in charge of the British occupation of Ireland. That's where he develops these ideas. American policing is also derived from colonialism, the Texas Rangers, but also the Pennsylvania State Police created in 1900, the first state police, are modeled on the US occupation forces in the Philippines in the late 1800s. Direct transfer of personnel, ideas, technology. So these things have always been co connected. We, we knew this in the 60s. We understood the connections between adventurism in Vietnam and repression, counterinsurgency policing here in home. And we've forgotten that history. And we need to relearn it. OK, let's hear from this brother. And uh, then we'll uh, get an announcement from Rachel. My name is Andre Taylor. I'm the founder of Not This Time. Uh, Initiative 940 started with my organization. Um, I, I had a question for Alex, and, and before I ask you this question, um, creating uh, Initiative 940 was a process of community members involving themselves and, and of, of natives, uh, black people, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders and Latinos coming together, something that hasn't been done in the country, which is how we created this largest people of color movement in the history of Washington State to force law enforcement to come to the table because we were winning the narrative fight. But what I have found, which I want to ask you, is that in conversations when decisions are being made, Impacted people are normally not in the room. The people that's in the room mostly are system people that are getting paid to do system work, white people, right? There's a saying that people who are as close to the problem are more closer to the solutions. And when you say that the reform has not been working, I believe in reform because we are reforming things by force, not by asking, right? But I believe, and I'm going to ask you, with all the reform that's been going on, who has been the decision makers? Have there been real impacted people? Because most impacted people's voices are not valued nor honored to be in the room to get information. If, if the system is ran by white supremacists, then they hold the terms to that uh, uh, reform. So at the end of the day, if you're not having the right people at the table, right, that have the information about their own communities and suggestions that are held with value, then of course those reforms won't work. I think the problem is, is that impacted people are not in the space or in the room and their voices are not being heard. Until that happens, like it's, being ha like it's happening in Washington State, then you are absolutely right. There won't be no reform. I, that's my question to you. So a lot of people across the country are, are watching very closely what's happening here. The, uh, uh, the Civilian Police Commission, 
uh, law enforcement assistant diversion programs, uh, attempts to create new accountability mechanisms, uh, and everyone's going to be looking to see what the effect of that is. I know that there have been some positive metrics. The number of felony arrests is down significantly here. The number, the, the head count in the county jail is down. Those are real metrics that I, that I take very seriously. Um, but we continue to use police to make the decisions, you know, who gets treatment and who gets jail. And the more we turn police into social workers, I have to ask, why aren't we just hiring social workers? <laughs> You're absolutely right that most of the time, police reform is driven by the needs of political officials to get out from under the crisis of legitimacy that they're facing. And if, even if we never asked for any of those things, they would want to give them to us, at least in appearance, to get us to be quiet. So we gotta be real careful what we're asking for, that we're not expending all our political capital asking to be at the table to fight for things that they want to give us to shut us up, that don't really solve our problems, that don't reduce arrest rates, that don't reduce violence rates, that don't reduce jail head counts, that don't reduce stop and frisk activity, that don't reduce the searching of our young people in, school, in their schools. Those have to always be the metrics, and ultimately we have to ask ourselves, even if we get some improvement on those things and we still have no jobs, and no decent health care, and no positive developments for our young people, have we really reformed what we need to reform? Okay, I would thanks. like to add a comment to that. For me, if we can save one life, it's worth it to me. Um, everything is not going to happen overnight. We're not going to be able to, to change a whole system overnight. We have to be able to start somewhere, right? And the fact that they are unaccountable for what they're doing means that in order to make them accountable, you can't just change the policy, right? Because the policy says, if you don't carry your taser that you could have used for Charlena, you get two days of suspension. So what it means to me is we have to change the law and when we change the law, you will be held accountable by the law that might make you hold, uh, carry your taser so that you do not end up in jail, right? Because at the end of the day, police officers are only going to do what they've been trained to do, right? So it's, you're, you're going to start here. It's, we have to start way up here. It's rank and file. They're just the rank and file officers. We ought to start from the head. And until we deal with the head, then we aren't going to get anywhere. And that's where we have to start with accountability and, and, and more training for them. Uh, Norm, oh, yes. Um, can I cut in? I'm, I'm going to have to uh, head out in the second half. So I just wanted to chime in uh, a little bit on one of the questions that came up both uh, in general, but also but on the board, was how, how to hold police departments accountable. And I, um, this might sound like a fantasy, and I might be full of it, and I'm open to persuasion. Uh, but I figure, since it's Red May, it actually might uh, be food for thought. Um, I think that one of the ways to hold police departments accountable is to, to go on strike against police violence. Because I, th I think unions, for the, except for the exception of, of, the, of the members of the Seattle Education Association and other teachers unions around the country, uh, by and large unions are not doing enough uh, to stop police violence and to stop the targeting of black and brown uh, people in this country. Um, I think about, for example, the union that I'm in. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that we are one of a number of uh, different uh, construction unions that are involved in the construction of the new youth jail. Um, it's, and you think about that, that the membership is building up this institution that will then turn around and imprison some of its members' own children. Uh, 
and 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 unions in general in the construction industry will say it's you know well, it's jobs it's creating jobs just like they you know have take some of them have taken real um, uh, uh, terrible stance uh, recently uh, around the um, uh, employee hours tax but anyway I digress I think you know going on strike against police violence could mean organizing the building trades unions to say we're not going to build that jail. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and if you were going to if you're going to contract non union contractors there, we're gonna make sure that they don't build it either. You think and then you think about what can happen outside of that. And what's changing in the city and the changing of, 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 uh, of, of our population, the forcing out of black and brown communities from the city. And you start thinking about what union construction workers can do by saying, we're not going to build another overpriced building until we know that we, our family members, our friends, our community members are going to live in it. It's simply not going to happen. We'll shut down this building boom. We'll shut down the way things are operating in the city. That kind of, of power that can be harnessed is what I think that can really, uh, really can pack a punch against police violence um, and start forcing some accountability. I'll add this, but the, the biggest thing that we have to do is we have to get the community to actually care enough to get behind the ones that are leading something and support it. The community support isn't there. People see it as, oh, that's their problem. No, it's everyone's problem. Just because it's not affecting you right now doesn't mean that it might not affect you a little bit later. And until we all stop seeing it as that's their problem and realize that it's our problem, then we might be able to get somewhere. How many of you guys are showing up to rallies? How many of you guys are supporting your local nonprofits fighting for change? What are you guys doing to lend your voice to the movement? Thank you very much. Um, Norm, you've written a whole book on this because I read it. So you have something to say about this? I, I could not uh, agree more that the solution to the, to the issue of police violence resides in groups like this within the community. If we are to ever achieve what I call the people's police, the people have got to exert, as Katrina has said and others up here have said, uh, a hell of a lot more clout than we have to date. If we were to look at these waves of reform or, or ostensible reform and look what they've accomplished, just as Alex was suggesting, I think we'd be appalled at the amount of time and money and energy and good intention on the part of a lot of well-intentioned people, we would realize that we have not gained the kind of progress that's necessary. And I believe that that's not going to happen until we rearrange the way the molecules are organized. Structure produces the culture. The culture gives rise to the behavior. We get fixated on the behavior, the individual case, for very good reasons. People are dying. People are hurting. It's understandable that we do that. And in addition to doing that, in addition to holding people accountable for the individual cases, we've got to look at putting the community in the driver's seat when it comes to controlling, regulating, policing. Communities should be involved in all policy making, all program development, all crisis management. The community should be involved in the hiring decision and the firing decision. The community should be involved in supporting independent investigation that Michelle was talking about. So the community, it seems to me, have, have, have got to achieve a level of sovereignty that currently just doesn't exist. But there are hopeful signs. Thank you very much. And um, uh, we have an announcement now from uh, Professor Rachel Chapman. And then we'll take our break. And I want to thank the um, people who are waiting to talk that they were willing to um, wait until after our break to, to have their questions. Uh, Rachel.
I'm really humbled in the face of this amazing panel and in the presence of Charlena Lyle's family. My condolences go out to you in prayers. As many of you know, University of Washington is like its own city. We have our own police force that doesn't have to answer to anybody. Um, and what, if any of you would like to get involved here on campus, you need to know that there's an organization called Concerned Faculty and another organization working to unionize here at the University of Washington called Faculty Forward. And we're working on two issues that are really important and we'd like, if you want to get involved, uh, for you to sign up and put your email so that when we get back to organizing, uh, you could be part of that. Faculty, staff, student, community members, anyone is welcome. There are two things that you need to know uh, about the police force, uh, about University of Washington that connects these issues. One is that it is also on our legislation that universities have to buy a certain percentage um, of their purchasing from prisons. It's in our legislation and it's mandated. Um, we feel that that is such a contradiction that we are in an institution that basically benefits from some of the children of Washington State never getting to college. We feel that's a direct link uh, prison to uh, school to prison pipeline. So the one, not one penny more is one effort that we're working on. And re relevant to tonight, we're working on a UW safe campus for all. People have been harmed in serious ways by the policing on the University of Washington campus. Um, and in response to that, we are trying to mount and we'll keep working on a UW safe campus for all project. Three of the main points are uh, de-weaponizing, disarming, and demilitarizing the police at the University of Washington, limiting or ending the presence of canine units, especially at student events and especially at student of color events, given the history of canine units in black communities. And most importantly, we want to get together all um, interests and expertise on campus to come up with a public health approach to security that we don't send weapons to most of the incidents that happen on campus that could be solved with a public health um, response. So there'll be sign-ups on either side um, in, in the front row. Please join us. Thank you. So let's take a break and please come back. <laughs> from Phil Walshelter from Red May. Uh, Red May has two, uh, uh, has two constraints for the month. We riff on red, these are all our flags, and we pretend for the month that, that the market is not the solution to the problems that the market creates. You can find more about us on redmayseattle.org, and we are running our fundraiser now so we can have another Red May next year. Uh, just enter Fan the Flames of Red May and you'll get to our GoFundMe. Uh, take a look at the video. If you like what you see, throw us a little cash. Thanks very much, and, and I have to say, this event here is more than we could have imagined when we asked Alex and uh, 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 David uh, to come out here. We imagined uh, exactly this kind of group of community leaders. Uh, uh, we thought we'd use Norm Stamper, we thought of Jesse. Jesse was uh, on a panel last year of ours called Philanthropists versus Teachers where he talked about uh, high stakes testing and so forth. So uh, this couldn't have worked out better with the merging of the two events. Um, hi, I'm an undergrad here at the UW, and um, I've always been interested about extreme ideologies. So uh, I, my question is, how does the rise of the extreme polarization of ideologies such as Antifa and the alt-right contribute uh, to the continuation of police violence as there is less and less middle ground reached between such groups? Right, very good. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've written a little bit about this in the context of, of um, the uh, violent conflicts that have happened over the last couple of years. And so this, of course, uh, presents a, a huge challenge for police 
because um, police have to manage these conflicts. And one of the things that most terrifies police is the possibility that a conflict, conflict like this is going to break out in an open carry state where then there's like actual shooting of people and then the police are trying to sort out who's armed, right? So w this, we may have worse to come in this direction. And I think, of course, the polarization of views has to do with economic insecurity that people are feeling and that the existing arrangements don't seem to be working for a lot of people. And so they're looking for solace in these extreme views. And uh, it, Chapter 10 of the book, Political Policing, talks about the fact that when we don't resolve problems of economic and political inequality through our democratic processes, because our democracy is greatly weakened, then you're going to get more contentious protest and struggle that can break out into violence. So this is a, a problem of democracy, ultimately, not a problem of policing, in my view. Hi, my name is Howard Gale. I'm a community activist that's been active on the issue of police reform the last few years. Um, I think out of respect, this is the anniversary, we're coming up on the anniversary of Charlene Lyles, and out of respect to her memory and her family, uh, I do think the, the, the dominant question should be, how do we, make, how do we not have this happen again? Um, and so I want to have a little pushback on what Alex and David said, because they talked about police reform tinkering around the edges, um, and that every police reform process leads to more cops. Um, I would also suggest that a lot of the high level things we aim for, you know, changes in society or reorganizing how, you know, maybe having communities police themselves, those things have also been offered in the past and haven't gotten us very far. I'm not suggesting we abandon that, but we do have a police reform process in this country, which is, I think, mistakenly, a lot of people look towards as a model, um, but it has serious flaws. And I'll give you an example very specifically of one of those flaws. A year before Charlena was murdered, someone was shot six times in the Central District because they were lumbering through the street in a mental health crisis with two knives. They were shot six times, miraculously they lived. How many people know about that? That was a total failure of our police reform system. The OPA took over one, the Office of Police Accountability, which is supposed to review that, took over one year to review that case. The Community Police Commission remained completely silent on that case. The Inspector General said nothing. If that had been adequately looked at, maybe Charlena would still be alive, okay? So we can nibble around the edges, and I think it's very important. I want to point out one other thing and then ask a question here. Um, I think it was Alex that said sometimes, or no, I'm sorry, it was David that said sometimes police reform processes can capture activism. And that's absolutely true. And I think that's part of what has happened in this city is that the Community Police Commission has actually captured a lot of that activism. I've heard a lot of people say, not to worry, the Community Police Commission is working on it. And there's been a lot of failings in our system of oversight. And one example is when we, passed our legislation or considered legislation in Seattle last year in 2017, um, people went to um, Los Angeles, New York, and a few other cities. The one city they did not go to to look at police reform was Newark, New Jersey. So I'd like to hear some comments about that um, and maybe some thoughts about why that should not be a model for police reform. Well, look, I am trying to figure out how to save lives. So let's not have any mistakes about that. And I'm trying to figure these things out in very concrete, empirical ways. Over a quarter of people killed by police are having a mental health crisis at the time that they are killed. Now, this has generated a lot of discussion about CIT training and the Memphis model. The research is not very good. The Memphis model has shown some positive results. This is uh, when uh, 
Officers are given special training about, the, about how to use resources. The Memphis model shows some good results when there's actually an expansion in the availability of community-based mental health resources. When that happens, there's some evidence that there are the fewer police use of force and arrest incidents. And so what that says to me is that the problem is not going to be fixed by the training. It's going to be fixed by creating a mental health infrastructure. And if you think about it, the training can't possibly work because it goes directly against all the other training they receive. See threat, neutralize threat. You can't train them to do two contradictory things at the same time, especially in a, in a dynamic where they don't know which situation it is that they're confronting at that moment. We have to develop an infrastructure so that when people have a mental health crisis, we don't get an armed police response. And this is not pie in the sky. Cities are experimenting with it. The UK has a lot of these systems in place. They're not adequate there either, but the idea that there's a different number, a different response exists. And I would just say that if we put our political energies, if we did our coalition building around that, we might save many more lives. So about, I think it's about 15 years ago, a, a uh, unsheltered man uh, in a mental health crisis shot a female Albuquerque cop and uh, she survived. And it was, it was a really, um, it was one of those, those crisis moments uh, that created a, a lot of um, demand for specific kinds of reform, specifically regarding the way that uh, the mentally ill were policed in Albuquerque. And I, and I want to, before I finish, just sort of echo what Alex said. I mean, m my interest is is absolutely in in trying to save lives. The, the whole the whole goal here, at least my efforts, both as a writer, or professor, as an activist, is what can we do to stop that next shooting, that next killing? And and so, one thing that happened in Albuquerque was they decided, well, we're going to embed these civilian. Um, uh, mental health professionals with police, and they created a special unit um, that was supposed to uh, be a kind of liaison on the street in those moments when cops find themselves in these inst instances that they don't understand and, and aren't good at handling. And so when the Department of Justice came to Albuquerque to investigate the Albuquerque Police Department, uh, uh, we, one of the things we realized was they didn't actually go out and talk to you on the street. You know, they had some community meetings where people had to come to them and they spent a lot of time with cops, but they didn't go out on the street. So we started going out on the street, uh, about 13 activists, and we ended up writing a report. And, and the report was based on these interviews we were doing, mostly with people who, who were unsheltered. And the first thing they told me was, I'm more scared of those people, those civilians who walk around in their blazers, um, because all they're doing is checking our IDs and, and, and if we have a warrant, the cops following them. So they're even more f frightened of those people, those people who are supposed to actually protect them from these situations that result in violence are producing more anxiety and not actually doing their job. Um, and as a result, not in any way helping, right? Here's, here's like this, the kind of reform you want. Mental health professionals, you know, on the street, as soon as you embed them with cops, they're cops. And, and that's what happens with that. So for me, we have to be very careful when we talk about reform, what we're talking about. Almost always, reform is about pacification, not transformation. I will, um, I'd like to just address this um, dichotomy that's being made between reforms and radical reconstruction, because I think that there's something we're missing in this conversation. Um, I think when we look at the origins of the police coming out of slave patrols and coming out of um, destroying working class organization in northern cities, we see that they're fundamentally a, a force for maintaining inequality. And when we understand those origins, then we have to understand how we completely remake society to not n need forces like that, right? But at the same time, right, I don't think that we can just leap over 
the reform process and get to the complete control of our communities, right? I think that it's actually through the struggles that, that Katrina is engaging in that we learn, right, the limitations of the reforms and that we build coalition with each other, right? So I think we need to be strategic about which reforms are useful and which ones are calling for more police and, and, uh, and you know, pointing backwards and making the problem actually worse, and which reforms like actually disarming the police um, are radical uh, reconfigurings of the police. I don't think we should be content with any reform though, right? We should, we should go for these accountability measures as much as we can, and the work that you're doing is inspiring, and it's mostly because, not because I think that that reform is going to change the nature of policing totally, but it's gonna bring us in coalition with one another, because it's only through a mass movement of millions of people Right, multiracial coalitions of millions of people in this country refusing to be policed uh, by a force that's fundamentally about maintaining inequality that we're ever going to be able to, to change this system, right? And to build that kind of coalition, we have to show that we have power and we can win. So when we win Initiative 940, right, we, sh we gain confidence and we show that we can do something. But we, we can't say that's it that we've solved it, right? We have to, we have to always say what's the next major uh, 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 movement against the police that we can, we can um, shoot for. And then I think when we're always escalating our struggle, we might be able to gain the massive numbers of people that it will take uh, to radically restructure our society and our police. I would just like to add this. Um, police are trained. Uh, we all know that. But I do believe that with proper and continuous de-escalation training, which they need, will cause them to begin to do things that they were not, that they were normally doing before. So they were trained to shoot center mass, right? So we have to retrain them to de-escalate and continue that training so that they change their mind into doing something different, to simply just settle with that's what they've been trained to do, so whatever. That's, that's, not, that's adding to the problem. Um, they have to be accountable, and part of that accountability is getting them properly trained. So they need, we can't just say, oh, they don't know how to do that, so they shouldn't be held accountable for that. No, they need to be held accountable. They need more than eight hours a year. They need constant and continuous de-escalation training so that we can begin to save lives. And I think that when you're talking about all these other things outside of reform, I haven't really heard you say anything tangible that we as community members can do now. We are living now. We are trying to stay alive right now. So what can you offer us right now that is going to help us besides reforming the system? Uh, uh, we'd like to get some more questions in, please. I know you have plenty to say. Yes, Michelle. We have hey, thank you. you. I'll, I'll keep it quick. So I just really wanted to amplify on some of the things that Jesse and Katrina said and also kind of call out something that Andre Taylor added. Because one of the key things that has happened in this state, and we're just at the beginning stages of it, so we don't know how it all is going to play out, but it has been the families of the people who've been impacted who have been in the conversation in a way that it hasn't happened before. And to me, one, and so, <clears throat> so first of all, that's extremely important. But uh, in addition, anytime you're solving a problem as huge and complex and hundreds and hundreds of years old as this problem is, you have to have multiple ways that you're attacking it. You have to have the way in which the families are interacting with the system. You have to be looking at the training and you have to be looking at like what the dismantling of it looks like, right? So there's, it, but it's not like it's just one of those things that's gonna get you there. It's a variety of different approaches. And so I think it's so important that we think about it in that way. Cause like Katrina said, right now people are trying to save their lives. And so there's an effort that has to happen there. And uh, also quickly, one of the places where I have been um, doing some work with the ACLU has been in Pasco, where some people here will remember in 2015, Antonio Zambrano was shot and killed when he was having um, a mental health episode, and he was shot and killed by the police. And the police have made... Uh, 
uh, a real commitment to examining what de-escalation looks like. They've changed their policy from like a one-page policy that said, you know, try not to shoot. <laughs> like, I'm, obviously I'm you know, being facetious, but to a very detailed with graphics, like how does this work? And not just have they changed the policy, but they're really intentionally training on it in a different way than they used to train on it. And of course, time will tell how that all plays out, but that is one element of a response that could make a difference and that could save lives. And so I just wanted to make the point for multiple approaches to get us to where we want to end up. Thanks. First off, I want to thank uh, Charlena and Chase's uh, family for being here tonight. Um, so I'm noticing like two major threat uh, trends with coming up during this panel, sort of reform and abolition. And I'm kind of skeptical of both paths, to be honest with you. Um, you know, to me, a reform, it always kind of has a price tag attached to it. It's like, well, we'll give more optional de-escalation training classes to police and maybe arm them with more tasers, body cams, and some jujitsu classes. And, uh, you know, the abolition um, question kind of uh, bothers me because, you know, I do think there are truly, like, antisocial people in this world. I think that there are people who need to be locked up, like Dylan Roof being one of them, you know. Um, you look at the situation where, you know, you have the whole Gamergate thing, and you have women calling the FBI with... Uh, death threats and you know they're not doing anything about it but when an Anaheim uh, police gets some kid to get off his lawn you know immediately they have you know four cruisers out front in front of this guy's house you know I was here uh, in Red Square on J20 when um, when a comrade was shot here um, so you know and, and we're facing a situation where you know Trump and people like him are at the helm of this infrastructure of this national security state, this surveillance carceral state. Um, so, you know, Norm said that the, the problem is really the culture, and I'm questioning, you know, what is, what good is it to throw a bunch of bad apples in a barrel, or a bunch of fresh apples in a, in a barrel of bad apples, you know, and they're just gonna all turn rotten. And so, I mean, what role do you think that counter-institutional, um, does uh, counter-institutional power have, you know? Um, looking back at the history of the Panthers and their community patrols of the police, or even here in Seattle, Q Patrol Seattle, um, trying to stop hate violence on Capitol Hill. And um, what ways can we now take power into our own hands instead of relying on uh, potentially fascist, uh, uh, racist police force? If, if, if the police in America belong to the people and not the other way around, we need to look at what role the community has in policing its own neighborhoods, its own communities. I'm a very strong advocate of the proposition that community policing is the community policing itself. It's the community uh, working to achieve public safety, the community working to achieve uh, 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 an honoring of our civil liberties. It is the community looking to reduce violence of all forms, including police violence. And the, leader the leadership of the community in this community police partnership uh, is, it, well, it's this, the community's the senior partner as I see it. So if, if we are really serious about true community policing, we embrace this notion that the community is here to police itself. I do describe a means by which that can be accomplished because in a tiny rural community, that's fairly easy theoretically to get our, our, our heads wrapped around. It's a lot harder in Seattle. Uh, or, or Pittsburgh or New York. It's a lot harder in the big urban cities than it is in smaller communities. But if you stop and think about uh, instances in which the community has actually achieved levels of, of, of safety and stability in the neighborhood without sacrificing or compromising people's human rights or their civil liberties, we have examples that we can use. I'll, I'll cite one very quickly. 
the Hillcrest neighborhood of San Diego, where I grew up, uh, is predominantly gay neighborhood. And uh, we experienced a series of very uh, serious gay bashings, people coming up behind uh, individuals, whether they knew their sexual orientation or not, uh, and beating them with pipes and baseball bats. And we concluded, I was a deputy chief at the time, we concluded that it's just a matter of time before somebody gets killed. And in fact, it did happen. A 17-year-old kid had come in from the suburbs to this area of the city to go to one of Starbucks's, you know, first uh, sh stores in, in, in Hillcrest. Uh, and three skinheads came up behind him, knocked him to the ground, and beat him to death. They all also stabbed him. So a week later, there are probably 700 people at a very large gay bar in Hillcrest. And uh, I was giving my usual talk. Well, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to be vigilantes. You, you want to protect the, uh, the civil liberties of your, your fellow citizens. Um, besides, it's dangerous. These individuals have shown us what they're willing to do. You know, they're, they're just vicious uh, skinheads. Uh, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and, and they're out to take care of business. So you want to be careful out there. Well, I'm giving this little talk, and from the back of the room, a big buff guy said, look, chief, if you don't catch these bastards, we will. My initial reaction to that was, well, you don't want to take the law into your own hands. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. And it occurred to me as I'm formulating my reaction to this guy, whose community are we talking about? Whose laws are we talking about? Whose loved ones are being beaten and in some cases killed? Why would I, as a representative of the government, tell you, a free, you know, an American and an ostensibly free and, 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 and uh, democratic and uh, pluralistic society that you can't take the law into your own hands? I'm not talking about an armed George Zimmerman zealotry. I'm talking about citizens who decide we're not just going to be, we're, we're, we're not going to roll over. We're not going to allow people to come into our neighborhood and terrorize us in this fashion and worse. And so they formed a citizen's patrol. And my question to them is, what can we do to help you? Well, one thing we could do was provide training and personal security. We did that. We also uh, asked if they would be willing to submit to a very cursory background check if they wanted to participate in this because people had come to us quietly and said, you know, most of the neighbors out here are really great, but this guy's vicious. This, this guy is, is going to ruin this experiment, that sort of thing. So we actually, with, their con with the community's consent, conducted NCIC, I mean, uh, National Crime Information Center checks. And a week into the patrols, driving their own personal cars, in their own you know, civilian dress, uh, they saw these three guys uh, moving in on a potential victim. And they did exactly the right thing. They didn't intervene. They called us. We swooped in. We hooked up these three guys, put them in the back seat of a caged police car, and drove them to jail. Shortly thereafter, each of the three was convicted of first degree murder. Each of the three was sent to prison. And that was a direct result of an authentic partnership, not some cosmetic PR version of a, a community police partnership. The community was truly in the driver's seat, and we were asking our residents, what can we do to help? So I think there are some concrete things that we can do in the interest of public safety. And one of the wonderful things that happens when you get citizens together, I use citizens not in the context of, of citizenship, but rather the citizenry of Seattle, the citizens of Ferguson, the citizens of New York. What, if you, if you, if you interact with people who are different, I shouldn't say you, 
if we interact with people who are different from us, with a common vision, a common goal, things happen. Uh, when I was doing my doctoral studies, I was in desperate search for, of a statement that, that would, would say exactly that scientifically, and I found it in an obscure little journal. People who spend time together begin to see things in common, and they begin to appreciate one another. And it's not some touchy-feely uh, phenomenon that I'm talking about. It's if you don't know me, we've never had a conversation about <laughs> like what we like to watch on TV or what we care about deeply in our neighborhoods or our communities, um, then there's a pretty good chance that that division between us will remain static or grow even greater. So I'm lecturing and I apologize. I think it's just vital that the citizens tell their police, tell their police, you do not have the right to make independent, arbitrary, um, unilateral decisions anymore on our behalf. We are going to be participating fully with you on those kinds of issues, and we are the senior partners in this partnership. That's the way it should be in a society like ours. Alex, I can see you're itching to get the mic. Um, oh. uh, 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 could you keep it brief, yeah. please? Because we like to get some that more was, questions. Yeah. In. Thank oh, you. Mm -hmm. But that was a t huge amount to respond to. So. So we want to imagine this police community partnership, but how many people think police should be the primary agency to deal with problems related to drugs? How many people think police should be the primary agency to deal with problems of school discipline? How many people think police should be the primary agency to respond to people in mental health crises? How many people think policing should be in charge of regulating sex work? How many people think police should be the primary agency to deal with youth in crisis when they're beefing with each other and they're, they're trying to figure out how to get to school safely? But this is what police do. This is the vast majority of what they do. Now, the things that can't be resolved in other ways, communal violence perhaps, armed bank robbers, okay, maybe we need some force that's capable of dealing with that. This to me is an empirical question. I, I'm, I don't use the word abolition once in my book. So there's a kind of mischaracterization of my views going on, I think, to some degree. And if there are reforms that help us reduce the burden of policing on people, I'm all for them. Like get the cops out of the schools and put in some counselors and restorative justice practices. This is not pie in the sky. We don't need nicer school police. We don't need better trained school police. We don't need school police to be mentors. We need no school police. It's a terrible idea. So, uh, so it's not that I'm against reform or against accountability. It's what form does it take and what relief do we really get as a result? Next question. Um, hello. I want to first say thank you to the Lyles family and the Taylor family for being here tonight, um, on the, and, and to Katrina in particular, and, and to you in particular for continually saying um, it can happen to any of us. It can be any of our neighborhoods. I live in a neighborhood nearby where Trelina was shot, um, and I spent that night in June crying on the front steps of my porch with my neighbors, wondering, I live next to a school, when is this going to happen to us? Um, so I want to say thank you for being here and having the strength to pick up that fight so quickly um, when you really should never have have to. Um, I have a question for both directly for you and for Jesse. Um, I am a preschool teacher right now and I'm working to become a educator, uh, hopefully that I can work in Seattle in my community. Um, as somebody working to eventually teach in Seattle, what initiatives and programs are currently in place for educators to learn about and kind of discuss these problems of violence against marginalized communities, um, both direct police action and also as systematic forms of oppression? Um, is this currently a major focus in liberal Seattle? Is that something that they're focusing on? Um, and if so, what resources and forums are there for educators in different capacities from special education to preschool to science education and not just our history and our literature teachers? 
Um, and then I also wanted to ask Katrina, as somebody who lives in the neighborhood nearby, what can I be doing um, in my group of neighborhoods that I know people care about these things? What can I be doing directly to reach out to them and form my uh, stronger community to prevent this sort of thing from happening again? Um, thank you. I think that um, the message that you probably need to um, convey in your community is get involved. And by getting involved, that means within my community, what can I do to make not only my community safe, but make everybody safe as a whole, right? So um, I don't know who the leaders are in your community, but you are always welcome to come to Not This Time that um, has meetings on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. Um, and there are members from your community that are there and everywhere. And you can get the information that you need to take back to your community to be able to galvanize your community in the proper way uh, to move forward. In terms of education policy around these issues we've been talking about tonight, they're severely lacking. Um, most of the big education initiatives that are being put forward um, by people like Bill Gates and the richest people in the world who are using their wealth to manipulate public education are all about more high-stakes standardized testing, right? Um, privatizing our schools, et cetera. Um, and very little is going into training teachers uh, to to um, understand how institutional racism is disfiguring our schools and uh, how to teach against um, racism, right? So those kinds of things are lacking. That's why we started the Black Lives Matter at School initiative. Um, and it started with one day action. Last school year, we had over 3,000 teachers come to school with the shirts, but then more importantly, it was about actually teaching lessons that day about the history of institutional racism in, in this city. Um, so that turned into a week-long action this year, right? And so now it spread to Philadelphia and into the East Coast um, last year, and then we got connected with them, and we actually organized a nationwide week-long action, Black Lives Matter, in our schools. There were schools that flew Black Lives Matter flags. There was um, curriculum that we, we produced and put online for teachers of, of every, from, from early childhood um, through 12th grade to use. And so those are initiatives that are grassroots, that have been organized by the Social Equity Educators Group that I'm a part of, um, that I encourage educators in the room to, to get involved with um, as a way to, to try to um, push back against the school to prison pipeline. And one of our main demands right, was, was about um, ending zero tolerance discipline policies and, and the, the cops in schools, and also ethnic studies, because I just want to end on this point that I think that the school to prison pipeline really begins with a whitewash curriculum that doesn't teach the history of our, our country, it doesn't teach the contributions of people of color. And when kids don't see themselves in the curriculum, they check out, right? When they check out, they get labeled defiant, but maybe that should be better understood as resistance to oppression, right? And that's why I'm proud that I'm teaching the first ethnic studies class in Seattle, and we hope to expand that across the district, make it a graduation requirement, and have those classes in, in every single school in Seattle. Okay, we've got about 12 minutes left, so um, next question, please. Good evening. Thank you for your time and everything that you've been sharing with us, and thank you for everyone's time in this room. Uh, I had questions, and some of them have been answered, so I'm going to rephrase, and I hope you'll bear with me. These are mainly for David and Alex. Uh, my original question was, when it comes to calls regarding mental health crises, some police agencies are able to dispatch social, social workers with their officers. And would you, require, would you recommend pursuing this as a requirement for all agencies? And so I heard you, David, when you said that these folks become cops that people are more intimidated by. And then also, my question was, or instead of having a requirement, should we pursue an entirely separate infrastructure and so, Alex, I hear you when you say that a in different infrastructure for mental health crises and different folks showing up would be good. Uh, 
And before I go to my fourth point, I would like to further Katrina's invitation to Not This Time. The Not This Time community is represented here and everyone is welcome every Wednesday at 6 p.m. And what I also wanna tell all you white people is that I can't get there on time and it's okay. If you wanna show up at 6.30 because you have to work late or at seven, if any amount of time that you want to come and share with us, you are welcome, all, everybody. And I'd like to come back again to what Christina then asked David and Alex, what are the tangible steps that we as a community who are here listening to you can take to create an entirely separate infrastructure of health officials to respond to the individuals experiencing mental health crises. And if you don't have specific steps, what are some resources or guides that you would refer us to? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I, I, my, my work um, right now is focused specifically on um, cop speak. And, and from my work as not just an academic, but an activist, doing the sort of work uh, that, that Katrina and you and Jesse have done, which I value above all other kind of work. And I think the solutions are in that, that really committed coalitional work. Um, and, and, but man, we are just co-opted by cop speak. <laughs> I'm just, it's, it, and I, I think we need to, we, we, I don't know what those solutions are, the communities, the, 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 they might be different from community to community, but we, we, I'm convinced that we're gonna have a really difficult problem in any community figuring out what that is until we can get that cop in our head out of our head and until we can start understanding um, the ways in which cop speak in the form of police reform seduces us into committing to uh, politically um, uh, political failures that don't actually save lives. And so what I'm interested in doing is trying to pull back the curtain and say, what, is it, what, is, what do cops mean when they say discretion? What do cops mean when they say justified? What do cops mean, right? What is the taser really all about, right? I mean, look, if we, so all seem to agree that the police come to us from a number of different genealogies, one of which is the slave patrol, one of which is the colonial militia, one of which comes to us from Europe, which was policing emerges in the transition from feudalism to capitalism as a way to control suddenly a mobile working class so they're available to capital, then, then how is that an institution we want at all? Um, so there's a police we have and there's a police we want. How do we get from the police we have to the police we want I think we're gonna to have to have a powerful movement, I agree with you, a movement that has a shared language that, that inoculates us from the cops speak all around us because, and also to, you know, to recognize there's many communities and in Albuquerque, the community I'm in, there's a very powerful white middle class wealthy community who has the police's ear, who has the newspapers as a, their, their platform um, and, and the police serve their interests completely. And so how do we confront that? And I think to be effective at it, that those coalitions and movements have to really uh, question the way we talk about police and how do we talk about police and what are these, what are these reforms really about and which reforms should we re support because they actually take away power from police. So I, I mean, I don't have any specific examples and I'm, I'm yeah, Alex has the examples. I mean, I think like m what my work is doing is, 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 is in some ways less empirical than Alex's. Mine is saying like, yes, I want all that, all those alternatives, but why have we never gotten to them before? What is that, how, how, what explains the sort of compelling power of cop speak and the, the reforms that never actually save the lives we wanna save? Let's confront that and then maybe we can actually start implementing the alternatives we, we really want. Okay, let's so, hear from Alex and let's see yeah, if we can get so another question he, in. I'll be incredibly concrete. Right now, in City Hall, there is a debate going on in the mayor's office about whether or not to fund services to expand the LEAD program. And the services they want to expand are supportive housing services. And every dollar we spend on supporting housing services gets people off the streets and reduces the need to involve the police. And a lot of those people have mental health problems that are dry, that, and they need those supportive housing services. So 
everyone should go home and write a letter to the mayor's office calling for them to dedicate the seven million dollars to expand lead funding so that we can get the police out of the business of managing homelessness and mental health crises. Okay, next question. Uh, hello, I just wanted to thank all panel members uh, for being here today and sharing your expertise and your experiences. Um, I also wanted to say that Katrina's uh, comment relating to um, just because it doesn't happen to us directly or impact us, um, it doesn't mean we're immune to it um, and that we can just ignore it. Um, so I think that really spoke to me and thank you for those words. Um, and it's something that I've, um, you know, really uh, have been thinking about being here as a graduate student. Um, so I just wanted to say that, you know, according to some research uh, that I conducted on college policing uh, mechanisms across the largest uh, college campuses um, across the nation, including uh, UW, uh, most are armed, um, I found, and that over 50% have active canine units, but only a handful actually have created oversight mechanisms whereby students, faculty, and other community members can air their grievances um, and uh, review police misconduct. Um, and these communities, uh, these uh, mechanisms seem to have more bite um, because it includes community members are able to review uh, these um, grievances against police members. Um, and it seems that these issues that we've been talking about bleed onto college campuses. And so it's very concerning because as we talk about racial profiling, the use of force, it also happens within our very walls. Um, and so my question is, how can this reimagining um, also occur on campuses with ac which has access to so many resources at its disposal? And what do you think the role of universities is towards uh, this reimagining of policing? Um, when comparing UW to other universities, it seems that the university is so behind um, other universities that have implemented strong accountability boards, limiting arming policies, and that don't depend on canines for their policing. Um, so what more can be done and how can we begin to also change policing within our very walls here at the University of Washington? You want to get all the questions? Uh... And you can answer them. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's <laughs> okay with me, man. Yeah, come on. Hi. Thank you all for coming, um, for being able to speak to us today. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, really quickly, um, I'm a young voter. I have a lot of friends who are in the 18 to 24 range and are starting to learn how to vote. How, um, how do I approach political offices that impact police like individually. Uh, we are going to be getting a new uh, Seattle Chief of Police by June 2018. Um, Durkin's gonna name her three nominees, I think, this week. Uh, to me, I feel like I don't want one. <laughs> but when I'm having this conversation with my peers and I'm trying to educate myself more about the police here, like on the local level, um, how do I start avoiding the conversation that is well, at least that one is the lesser of two evils, you know? How do I avoid that kind of conversation? Thank you. Okay, you guys got that, right? Okay, next one. Hi, I, Martina Morris. I'm also with the Not This Time activist group. Um, I'd like to acknowledge not just the Charlena Lyles family, but in particular, the incredible strength and fierce resilience of the two women who spoke to us tonight. Um, my question is a real wonky one, and I haven't heard anybody address it way down in the weeds. When you start looking at um, the, the collective bargaining agreements that actually determine how we hold police accountable in their own organizations, those are off limits to almost all policy efforts, I think, that people have undertaken. Nonetheless, it turns out that's where the details are, and that's where you get to decide whether or not somebody gets a one-day suspension because they didn't bring their taser and shot somebody instead. Those are, those are the details we care about the most. They are collectively bargained away, and in fact, the judge who was overseeing the Seattle consent decree and is still overseeing this kind of second phase delayed getting into the second phase because he said, you're making all of these promises to me about how Seattle's gonna change its policing policy, 
but you're about to go into collective bargaining negotiations, and all of those can be bargained away, every one of those things, right? So how can I say that what you've agreed to do here is acceptable and we can move on to the next stage? So I think this is a really important problem. I'd love to know, has anybody anywhere successfully attacked this issue? First of all, I want to thank you guys for having this event. I want to thank the panel and thank the audience. My name is Dove, and I'm the co-founder of Not This Time. Um, during Initiative 873 and then the birth of Initiative I-940 through our organization um, was really an eye-opener. When my brother was killed in 2016 by Seattle police, we came out here uh, truly ignorant to the laws in Washington state and probably ignorant to the laws in the rest of the nation. What we didn't know is that the law prior to this was that police officers were able to shoot a fleeing felon in the back. And there must have been some complaints, right? That turned out that after that, they created this law, which puts malice, and then you have to prove malice. And not only malice, there is a good faith intent belief on there. To me, they're both state of mind languages. You really can't prove either one. Neither one of them are good. Um, what we don't, didn't know is that that law was created so that police officers would never be criminally charged, only civilly. So I think that we're forgetting the whole, not just slave patrol era, but that is the law that they continue to make so that police officers are never accountable, which gives you the bravery and the fearlessness when they go out and police people. I don't believe that police officers are freaking scared. Because if I walked around with a gun on my hip, I think I would be less afraid than any other community member that doesn't have a gun. I would feel all the more protected. I've seen police officers sit in a room, one with a gun on their hip and one without a gun. And if you sit and watch just their movements and their body language and the way they interact with people around them, it's totally different. I've seen it with gang members. If you're a gang member and you go out in the community with a gun, you're not even afraid to be around the other gang members. You're opposing gang members. But if you don't have a gun, you probably ain't even going to come out your house. So I go back to say that what was so profound is how many people in the community were not aware of what the law states for police officers. And our black community would be, yes, I'm black. Our black community would be like, you know what? Um, I don't care. The police are just going to get away with it anyway. And when we educated them on why they get away with it, because there's zero accountability, zero accountability. I haven't heard, I heard people say what's going on, but I haven't heard any resolve up in here. 940 is the beginning to a resolve. And we are bringing community who never had a voice before because they didn't know what the problem was. Our black community always says, man, forget that. They going to keep killing us, whatever but they didn't know the law. I've talked to so many of our young men who say, you know what, we're just gonna start retaliating. I'm like, hold on, let me educate you on the law so that you can become learning about the law, so you can know the rights, so you can know why police officers go out and act so brave. If I had a job and I was giving full opportunity to just act up, and act badly, I would probably, if I wanted to, if I'm mad at somebody, go cuss them out and do whatever I wanted to do also, right? And so they do the same thing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why they are acting and behaving badly. And we always say, you say there's good officers, but we believe if a so-called good officer is witnessing another officer behaving badly and you do nothing about it, you're all bad. Yeah. 
So, um, what do you think the role of uh, watching uh, TV cop shows and uh, buddy cop movies is in naturalizing the point of view of the police for people who have seen thousands of hours of these all their lives? And do you think there is any possibility, for example, of encouraging progressive actors in Hollywood to take a, a kind of Me Too movement approach and say, we will not be in movies that glorify cops? So what I want to say to um, your question is, I'm not so sure that the actors don't have it spot on. I, when my cousin was killed, I'm thinking, they're, they're not really covering up stuff. They're not really doing all these bad acts that I see on TV. Well, in all actuality, yes, they are. So I don't necessarily believe that the actors aren't portraying what's actually happening. They are covering up stuff. They are out there um, doing bad things and, and, and planting evidence and all those things. You're seeing it play out more because it's, we're able to use our phones to capture it. It's happening. It's happened, it happened in my cousin's case and it will continue to happen. The actors are just telling everybody else what's actually happening. Thanks. I mean, yeah, first I just want to thank everyone who worked on Initiative 940 because that's been the main, yeah, and not this time. That, that effort has been the main consciousness raising effort that's gone on in this city and this state um, to raise awareness of the lack of accountability. And those, those types of, of reform efforts are critical to beginning to build a consciousness and an awareness, um, as the last couple speakers said, around the, the depths of this problem. And I think that it's through that mass coalition building that we'll, we'll be able to, to confront the police and to change the, the situation we find now that our other speakers, I think, spoke really well to. The fact that every problem that we have in our society, the only answer that's given to us is more police, right? So you have homelessness. What's the, what's the, the cure? More police. You have, you have um, discipline problems in schools. It's more police, right? And in fact, we need to change that calculus because we know that, that is unhealthy for our communities. When they're building that $200 million youth jail, they're getting ready to fill it, right? And we need to understand that that $200 million invested in the Seattle Public Schools for restorative justice programs and ethnic studies curriculum would, be, would keep those kids out of that facility in the first place, right? And we know this, but we won't be able to get there without a mass movement, uh, uh, right? Organized people fighting back and raising this in forums like this and then taking it out to the streets and building something larger than we saw in the civil rights movement. That was a great start. It was cut down by COINTELPRO and police. We have to build something bigger that gets more fundamentally at at the inequalities in our society. And I would just certainly echo what I've heard here and very much appreciate the comments that we heard from those uh, who are raising questions uh, at the side of the, uh, of the room. Uh, Timothy Lohman was a police officer in Independence, Ohio, who got fired because he fell apart on the police pistol range. A couple of years later, the Cleveland, Ohio Police Department hired him. Not long after that, he shot and killed a lonely 12-year-old boy, Tamir Rice, on a snowy field. How in the hell is it possible that this man, 19 minutes away by car from Cleveland, Ohio, was hired by that much bigger police department? Independence did a good job of documenting why they fired him. You can't have police officers falling apart emotionally on the pistol range. The deputy chief wrote a nice letter saying basically you may be a nice guy, but you are not a police officer. So I think we need to, to reinforce the necessity for firing police officers. We can debate fear and so forth, but that's for another time and place. But fire, thank you, but fire police officers and prosecute police officers who would be, if they were civilians, would in fact be held accountable. 
So on college policing, there are a number of struggles that have occurred recently on this. I was just at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore last week, and they successfully blocked the arming of their police. And they did it in coalition with communities surrounding the university who said, we don't want more armed police in our communities who aren't even accountable to us remotely. They're accountable to the university administration. Every dollar spent on campus police is a dollar that's not spent on instruction. So there's plenty to work with there uh, and keep fighting that battle. Uh, collective bargaining. So uh, last year, the city of Austin uh, bargained a deal with the police. The community organized against it and got the city council to block it. So this can happen. There's a similar campaign underway right now in San Francisco. So there are examples out there. Uh, TV cop shows, let's just remember a lot of these, while there are some that show the corruption and the brutality, that's really the exception. The history of, of police television shows is really a history of co-production with the police department. Dragnet, Adam 12, these things were produced with police cooperation to try to restore legitimacy to policing, that this idea that they're all professional and unbiased. Cops, the, we've had decades of cops directly co-produced by police departments. And if, the, if that show ever showed real misconduct, corruption, or brutality, no police department would ever work with them again. So it completely skews our vision of what the police look like. Uh, police are among the most unionized workers in the, in the country. Uh, and, and they're violence workers, so the, bar, the collective bargaining agreements, uh, they're bargaining over violence as a condition of their employment. So you're absolutely right. I mean, that's an important point. And, um, and we should remember, too, that police unions aren't in solidarity with other workers or other unions. I mean, police unions emerged really out of the civil rights protests in the 50s and 60s in, in which cops became targets uh, by civil rights protesters who recognized that they were upholding Jim Crow laws in the South and then union activists and, and workers who recognized that they were strike breakers in the North, and the police response was, let's, let's, let's collectively bargain, let's cre create unions of our own, um, but they're not in solidarity with other workers or other unions. And so, right, and every, the DOJ came to Albuquerque and, and the, the collective bargaining agreement was absolutely um, uh, uh, an impediment to any effort to confront issues because they, they had a, contractual agreement that allowed them to define the conditions of their employment, which included the right to use violence. Let's just remember, cops are violence workers. And, and, and that's what they bargain about. Okay, uh, before we hear from Michelle, uh, we, will, we are going to be fined for the minutes that we spend over. So if anybody should ask you, uh, we ask you to leave and you refuse to go, okay? <laughs> All right, so Michelle, go ahead. Please. <laughs> the only thing I wanted to quickly do was to respond to the young person who asked about uh, voters and how you make a difference. And there were a lot of instances, for example, when the uh, Community Police Commission was being, uh, was at risk of, of uh, being sunsetted because of the process with DOJ, uh, you know, it was before the city council and we asked uh, people in the community to, to write to their city council members and say, we want to keep the community police commission, this is important, we need to have that. We need to have the Office of Inspector General be added uh, as a part of, uh, of police accountability. And so there are a lot of things that will come up from time to time that are opportunities for you to speak up. And you're right, we are in, in uh, about to have a new police chief. I was uh, look, looked at the website earlier today, I noticed that you know all the surveys had closed down because the process has been moving forward, but when those three people are named, you absolutely have the ability to uh, write to the mayor's office and write to the co-chairs of that committee and express your feelings and your views about who those people are and the relative merits that you might see in it. So I just want to say that it's not just about voting. There's a lot of ways that you can engage. And when these things are happening in the city government, the county government, you can reach out to your council members, to the mayor, to the county executive, and let them know your views. So that's just the last thing I want to throw out. <laughs> OK, thank you all very much. I think we're done. Um, I appreciate your presence and your insights. Thank you.